It is BBC Radio 6 Music, and that is Diane Young, and it's Vampire Weekend. Ezra Koenig, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. I don't think we've I've, I've had the pleasure of interviewing you before, but obviously I've seen you live so many times over the years. Can you believe it's almost 20 years of Vampire Weekend? Does it feel like 20 years? Yeah. I, well, the band started in 2006. I mean, I think it's like anything getting older. No, the number sounds crazy. And then I think about everything that happened over the uh, the last 20 years, and then I think uh, it sounds about right. Sounds about right. Only God Was Above Us is out in April. And this one's specifically about New York City, Ezra. Well, I think there's quite a bit of New York, or at least memories and fantasies of New York, for sure. But recorded all over the world. Yeah, a little bit in Manhattan. The, the last few years, I just happened to be living all over the place with my family. So this is the most Vampire Weekend ever recorded in the UK, in London. All right. My family was living here for about six months. And um, Ariel Rexhide, my dear friend and close collaborator, he, he was happy to come out. So we were posted up in London. We were recording in a little studio in Maida Vale. And finally, I've been to London so many times over the years, but being posted up here for six months, I, I think I finally put it all together. Okay. Now yeah. I get it. <laughs> now you know what it feels like for us going for a weekend to New York and sure. going, huh? How does mm -hmm. this all work? Right. I saw you once, Ezra. I think you were going to record a session for Joe Wiley on Radio 2 at night. And I saw you wandering the streets of London on your own. And you had some headphones on and you were kind of walking past a coffee shop and walking <laughs> towards Oxford Street. And I just, I, I clocked you and I thought, that's Ezra from Fanboy Weekend. And there's a man who looks comfortable in a crowd of people in a city kind of moving along as one. Is that a fair assessment? Totally. When I wasn't working, all I did was just walk around. It's my favorite thing to do. I'm a walker. Do you still have time to do that? Yes, because we take a leisurely, humane pace in making our records. <laughs> There's always lots of time for strolling. And, and truly, I don't know if there was a study or something, but I, anecdotally, it feels right that you get good ideas when you walk. Okay, yeah. And do you jot them down or do you just try and remember them? Yeah, I have my little notes app on my phone. And, and you know, I think especially for lyrics, I'm probably not going to sit down and write a piano concerto in my mind as I walk, but I might realize that I, I should change a word in a line. That happens all the time. Does it? Well, the reason we played Diane Young there is the song we're about to play, the first song we heard from this new record, is Capricorn. Mm. And there's a reference in Capricorn to Diane Young. Will you please explain, join the dots for us? Well, it's fun. I've, I've thought about this one a bunch. When I first wrote this line in Capricorn, too old for dying young, too young to live alone, I wasn't trying to be like, oh, I want to have a reference to the old song. I, I really didn't. But then, of course, as I'm singing it, I'm, you know, then I'm thinking about it. But this song has a lot of a uh, feeling of being in between or a feeling of uh, unease in it. And, you know, that's Capricorn, the person who was born at the end of the year and then immediately a new year started. As I've gotten older, I've become a little less of a, a smart aleck. Ultimately, it is just the same phrase, but an extra layer of meaning. Why not? And truly, you know, that's the difference between being... Um, 27 or whenever that original song and now is that you know at a certain point you can't die young anymore which is an achievement it's a good thing of course let's hear capricorn this is vampire weekend <laughs> that's capricorn vampire weekend's new one from the forthcoming album only god was above us is the fifth record and it's out on april 5th can you tell us about the artwork, the, the story, and you know, it's a real-life story that spawned the title for you for Only God Was Above Us, Ezra? Sure. This album, we just got unbelievably lucky. I, I'd seen this one image online, and I started researching this photographer, and it was a guy who in the 80s named Steven Siegel. He took a lot, a lot of pictures of New York, and there's a particular group of pictures that he took in what he described as a subway graveyard in New Jersey, where all the subway cars were overturned. So there are these very surreal pictures because he and his friends were kind of horsing around so they could get these kind of very surreal images where people would be standing sideways or kind of like walking on the walls. 
no editing, you know, just because the subway cars are overturned. So there's one in particular. I saw it and immediately the, this image struck me. And it's the one that became the cover. When I saw it, it kind of reminded me of like a Pink Floyd album cover, but then it's in this kind of mm. New York subway thing. And I started to describe it to everybody. And I was like, it's like Pink Floyd meets the Beastie Boys. And that's where we should be going anyway. So I was so excited about it. And it's a, this beautiful image. And the only text in this picture is, is a 1988 copy of the Daily News that one of the guys is reading. And the headline that day happened to be, Only God Was Above Us. So, you know, at first I thought, well, I guess that could be the album title. And it kind of just seemed like, well, all right, that's what it says on the paper. Yeah. And then, you know, as the years go by, because that's how long it takes us to make records, the more I thought about it, I started to not only just feel like it was an acceptable album title, but I started to feel like this was destined. This is the only album title. This is perfect. So it comes from a desperate, desperate place then. I mean, this is a survivor of a terrible accident, right? Saying only God was above us. Yeah, and I didn't even know at the time. The real story is it was a flight to Hawaii where the roof ripped off. One of the guys on the flight was quoted as saying only God was above us. So he was just referring to the fact that the roof had ripped off this flight to Hawaii, which must have been a harrowing experience for everybody involved. Because when you think about it, what a strange headline for a newspaper, only God was above us. But yeah, it's a quote. Tell me about your family and, and New York. What's, what is your relationship? How far back does it go to New York with you? Supposedly, the, the first Koenig came in the 19th century. The story they always tell in my family is that he had come from Hungary to London. And then they said you could either pay $5 to take the boat to New York or you can take a free boat to Australia. And, and he said, I better pay $5 because I, I don't want to go to the, I don't want to take the free boat. That, that can't be good if they're, if they're giving it away for free. And so he ended up in New York. And beyond that, a lot of people from the rest of the family immigrated over the next 30, 40 years. And I've just always kind of felt like that 20th century New York period, it's just the period I associate the most with my parents and my grandparents. You know, they're all from this like small dense city. So in, in some ways, I always kind of felt like, well, that's the, that's where the family comes from. Cause you go past that, you're talking about places that don't even exist anymore. So it's kind of felt like, well, that's, yeah, that's where these people come from. Yeah. Talking of traveling and exploring other parts of the world, you have to tell us about going to study the musical form of, is it Raga? With Terry Riley. Now I've been listening to In C in preparation for today. Mm. So I'm, I'm very zen. So first of all, who is he? And tell me about the raga style of singing that you've been learning. I don't want to overstate it. This was one lesson, but I did get to know Terry a bit. As, as I said before, my family was living all over the place. My wife was working in England, and then she was working in Japan. Terry Riley is an absolutely amazing, incredibly influential American composer. He was one of the pioneers of minimalist style, like you said, in C, going back to the 60s kind of a forebearer of Philip Glass, also a synth pioneer. Some of his early synth records are unbelievable. The Who song, Baba O'Reilly, the Riley part is a tribute to Terry Riley. And he studied the Indian spiritual form of singing raga. He had a guru who he studied with. And while I was in Japan, just a friend of mine, you know, texted me saying, I saw a post on Twitter that Terry Riley lives in Japan. He says if anybody should hit him up if they're in Japan. I said, really? Why, do, why does he live in Japan? I had no idea. Anyway, reached out to him, got to know him a bit. He, he lives in the countryside, but he would come to Tokyo to perform. So I got to see him a few times. And then we went out to visit him where he lives, my family and I, and he teaches raga singing. And this is the way the technique that he learned from his guru in the 70s, he spent a lot of time in India and somebody's kind of playing a drone and then the teacher sings over that with their version of, uh, you know, what we call in um, Western music, uh, solfeggio, you know, like do re mi, you know, uh -huh. and you kind of just repeat it. So I only dip my toes into it, but getting to spend time with Terry and learning more about his worldview and his history is unbelievable. He's truly one of the greats. And did any of the raga singing make it onto the new record? I don't know if I can go that far. You know, but one thing you need to know about Pepper Weekend Records is that we start the song so early. Like sometimes I don't want to make them sound old, but it's like 
we tinker with them so much that, you know, that'll have to be for the next record. You know, it's, right. we're on a long schedule. So you wait for, for things to sink in and to make sense before you start kind of experimenting with what you've learned. Exactly. We like to re-record the drums 10 times and rewrite the lyrics and you know so even though the songs have their roots and then we need a few years to take time off and come back to them mm -hmm. am i right in saying that this is quite a bleak record from from you guys and is that a fair representation and is that a reflection of what's happening in the world through your view it's always tough i i, I think maybe some some of our listeners divide the records into roughly speaking happy and sad by that binary, I can understand people are going to throw this into the, the bleaker, darker, sadder category. And yet, I hope that every record is some sort of contains the duality of experience. I think this record's like a bit of a journey. The final track is the longest song we've ever done, and it's called Hope. So ultimately, I will call this an optimistic record, but sometimes you need the dark to, to bring out the light too. So there's bleakness in it for sure. But I think it, it lands in a quite optimistic place. Let's hear the other song that we're allowed to play. This is Gen X Cops. This is Vampire Weekend on Six Music. Gen X Cops is the brand new one from Vampire Weekend and Ezra Koenig is my guest. Can you tell us a little about, well, the, the recording process for that? That does sound like the drums were recorded ten times. They were. And all credit to that. I mean, obviously to Chris Thompson, who I co-wrote that song with. That's, that's one that Chris and I started a long time ago. And it's the first Vampire Weekend song that really comes out of me and Chris collaborating like that. But also, it's because Ariel is one of the most dedicated people on earth. And he, there were a few times, you know, maybe by version seven of the drums where I said, I think this is okay. I, I can't think about this anymore. But he was chasing a specific sound. There were times he thought it sounded a little bit too good. You know, there's infinite ways that drums can sound, and that's how we work. And this is your friend and producer, Ariel Retscheid. Yes. Yeah, and you've worked with him quite a bit over the years. Yeah, he's been working with Vampire Weekend since Modern Vampires, which was 2013. Yeah, right. And you mentioned the two Chrises there, because for a while, Ezra, we only saw you in pictures of, of Vampire Weekend. Has that changed now? Totally. Now there's pictures of, of all three of us. I, the, one thing that we discussed going into the last album was after uh, Rossum had left the band, it kind of felt like we needed a, a bridge or something. And the three of us have always been a unit in some ways, but at that time, it didn't feel like the way to present ourselves. So we, it kind of felt like, well, either we show our whole big new band, because now we are putting an emphasis on the live show and having more people on stage, or sometimes I have to go represent the band. But it felt like, it always felt like there, there was going to be this bridge into the moment where we can kind of like stand together as three. It was always something that was discussed behind the scenes. And um, this record, I think, is a slight more reflection of that. And we even have some other projects that involve just the three of us, but very early to talk about. But that unit is very meaningful, even though Vampire Weekend has always been an atypical band with a very strong role that our producers over the years have played and the strong role that our live members played. But, you know, me, Chris and Chris, there is something, especially as we get to that 20 year milestone where we kind of feel like, you know, there's just no replacement for that kind of history and that kind of bond and brotherhood. Are you saying, Ezra, that the three members of Vampire Weekend are starting a side project with the exact members, but with a different name? I might be saying that, but this is way, I, I should have discussed it with the other guys, but we talked about, you know, here's the thing. Very early on, Vampire Weekend became such a studio project, arguably from the first album, certainly by the second album. And yet there's something about the three of us playing together, which is very unique. And there's not always room for it in the vision of the albums, and it, but it is something very special to us. And the, the one Vampire Weekend song that I think captures that energy the best has always been Cousins. Because mm. I used to play this riff in sound check and then C team bass on down and you know that classic frenetic bass and you know they have such a sound as a rhythm section. So anyway, as Vampire Weekend becomes this whole big universe full of different ideas and stuff, that is something that we find ourselves occasionally going back to and wanting to like do something special with. 
Yeah, oh, brilliant. I am going to ask you next about the song that you've never heard by your band played on the radio, and then we'll play it, so have a think about that. Mm. And when are you hitting the road again? Are you looking forward to debuting these songs live? Oh, absolutely. We're having a ball in rehearsals, just working on the new material. And then, of course, we, we can't help ourselves. It's so fun to kind of reimagine some of the old songs and work on covers and all that stuff. So, yeah, we've been rehearsing quite a bit. We'll be touring a lot starting in June. But even before then, we're doing this uh, show during the Total Eclipse in Austin on April 8th and some festivals. So this is going to be a really fun year. How does a live show doing a Total Eclipse work? Well, we've been discussing it. I think the light starts to get pretty funky an hour before the actual Total Eclipse. We've debated a bit. My feeling is, out of respect to uh, Mother Nature during the total eclipse part, which is only about two minutes, maybe we should stop playing. And actually, I think everybody in the band will want to throw on the glasses and take a look, too. So I think, well, you know, we'll, we'll do one set, let the eclipse happen. I mean, you're not going to beat that in <laughs> terms of showmanship. And then play some more after. And also, I want to hear hear the eclipse you know like I have, I have a buddy who saw one once in wyoming and he was like whoa it's it's weird the birds go silent mm. yeah you know i think i think it might be cool to to be quiet and and just hear what's happening yeah you'll get wolves howling and stuff won't you probably yeah and there's a lot of bats in oh, austin yes, they, they live under the yeah the famous bats that live under the bridges yeah so who knows we'll, what'll happen yeah uh, uh, I'll, I'll be excited to see We'll wait patiently for the next time that Vampire Weekend return to the UK. Best of luck with this brilliant new album. I've been so lucky to have a sneak preview of Only God Was Above Us, which is out in April. I'm sure we'll hear more from you around the release date. Thanks so much for being on, Ezra. And have you thought of a song that we can play now that you personally haven't heard from Vampire Weekend on the radio? We're just working on this in rehearsal. This one is sometimes people forget about it because... At the last minute, we cut it from our first album, so it became kind of a bonus track, B-side. Maybe it's been played on the radio, but, you know, it was never a single. So going back to the early days, this was a, a one maybe not everybody knows and probably didn't get a lot of play. This is one of my favorite Vampire Weekend songs, and it's called Ladies of Cambridge. I love this song. Lovely to chat to you. Thanks yeah, for your thanks time, you. Ezra. All thanks for best. having me. Nice to talk to Have you. Have a good one. 